Welcome to Let's Go, where you will hear about lives that have been transformed by the power of God. You'll see and hear real stories of real people going to real places far away whose lives are changed as God uses them to impact the lives of others for His glory. Get ready to see people experience God's love and power. Let's go. Welcome to Let's Go. I'm Pastor Pat McGuffin. On today's episode, we're going to hear from Stephen Halford, a church planting missionary who will discuss the expansion of God's kingdom around the earth. We'll have a time praying together for the many needs that we're seeing. We'll have a powerful time of teaching and exhortation from Pastor Tony Nardella that we know will be a blessing. So let's go. It's so good to have you with us today. I have the privilege of introducing our special guest, my good friend, Stephen Halford. Stephen, it's good to have you on the show. Good to be here, thanks. Now, Stephen, I know that you're an evangelist and you've pastored and you've planted churches and you've gone all over the world preaching the gospel. Tell us what countries you've gone to minister in. Well, England, being from England, North America, I've been to Belize, Guatemala, um, all South America, all over the Caribbean, uh, uh, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Nigeria, uh, Pakistan, the Philippines, Japan. Oh my, that's um, the whole world, Stephen. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> How many nations have you ministered in? Uh, I don't remember, probably about 30 or 40, maybe 35, yeah. So Stephen, with all of those countries that you visited, uh, tell us one that really sticks out that really has a special place in your heart. Well, I have to be careful I don't offend anyone from any of the other countries. So, but probably the best, my favorite place is probably Uganda. Um, that's because I've been there the most and I feel comfortable there. I'm at home there. Uh, a friend of mine is the father of the revival that broke out in 1979. And I stay with him when I'm there. And he's a worker of miracles, raised many people from the dead, uh, two of whom I've met. Um, and the miracles that we see when we're there are just, just crazy. But Uganda is special for me because of the hunger, the hunger in the people, in the villages, the towns, the cities, um, but especially the villages. Um, I'm from a village myself in England, and uh, my heart is for the vi villages, not just the cities. So tell us about the spiritual hunger of the people. How does it uh, manifest itself? Well, the further from the cities you go, the, the hungrier people get, the freer they seem to be no offense mm -hmm. for those in the cities. Uh, it's just the way it is, I think, throughout most cultures. And uh, it just, they have witch doctors out in the, out there. Mm -hmm. And so they're used to the supernatural. They believe. I think one of the issues we maybe have in America or especially in England is not that we have a, a lack of belief, but a presence of unbelief. So there they, they don't have that. They have a presence of belief, maybe in the wrong thing, but they believe. And so we come along and present Jesus to them who works miracles, greater miracles than what their witch doctors can do. And it reminds me of Moses when uh, he, he, he threw down the staff and it became a snake and ate the snakes of the, of the, of the soothsayers, of the magicians. And uh, it's similar to that. So we come along, Jesus does miracles greater than what their witch doctors can do. And uh, people believe and revival breaks out. Well, tell me just one or two of these uh, stories about miracles that you have seen with your own eyes. Well, there's a lot. My my favorite miracle is in Pakistan, actually, and it doesn't seem like the biggest miracle, but it's my favorite one. A boy, a young boy who was 12 years old, he came to one of our meetings in a small room, and there was maybe only a hundred people there. And as we were preaching on intimacy with Jesus, we started praying for the sick. And this one boy was brought forward, a Muslim boy in a Muslim town. Uh, the Muslim village, and he'd never spoken before a day in his life, never said a word, never uttered anything. And so I walked up to him, laid my hands on him, and I rebuked this deaf and dumb spirit. And he, he uttered something, and the whole room just went, <gasps> and everybody went quiet. And and they, I didn't know what else to do except for I commanded him to speak. I said, in the name of Jesus, speak. And he didn't understand my language, so they had a translator. And he didn't know what to speak. So I said, say Jesus or say Isa. And so he said, Isa. And then he said, Jesus in English. So the first word he ever said was Jesus. And the second word he said was hallelujah. And by the end of the meeting, he was screaming hallelujah. And 
the boy's family just fell to their knees, started crying, then they started repenting, and then they got up believing. And there was a 90-year-old man in the corner who crumbled to the floor, and he jumped up about a minute later, thought he had died. He jumped up a minute later screaming, hallelujah, hallelujah, and he got saved, and the whole village ended up getting saved. And the boy went to school, and, he, and a year later I checked up to see how he was doing, and he was fully healed and uh, was in school, and the whole town ended up being believers from that one miracle. So that's probably my favorite miracle because the whole village got saved. Well, that would be kind of special in my book too. <laughs> now, how old was this boy that couldn't talk and then he started to talk? He was 12. Wow, that's incredible. 12 years of never talking yeah. and then being able to speak because Jesus set him free. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty special. Does that kind of make you want to go back? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it makes me want to go back all the time because the, the hunger, but growing up in England, even even without the hunger in some places, it, you just see the need. You know, the people are needy for Jesus. They're lost. They they don't have hope. And uh, it's the hope that, that drives me, that wants me to, to go. The hope that is found in Jesus. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I'm the first generation Christian ever in the fa in my family. And I know that I was lost and I found Jesus and I want to give him away. Yeah, praise the Lord. Um, now, I know you don't get paid much for doing this, right? You're, I know you as a contractor, you help build homes. Yeah. Um, so why, what is this, are you telling me why, you're go, why you like to go? Well, I, not only do I not get paid to go, but I pay to go, right? And so the difference between a, a calling and a career is when you have a career, you tend to get paid. A calling, you'll be willing to do it for free for as long as it takes to get it done. Now, occasionally, I do have seasons where I'm not working so much in the secular field and I'm doing more ministry, and other times I'm doing more secular work and less ministry. But every day I'm, I'm praying for people, preaching to people, um, and praying for the sick, whether it's on the streets, in a restaurant, Wherever, wherever I go, Jesus goes because he's with me and in me. Now, when you go to these places, um, it's kind of hard not to fall in love with the people. Am I right about that? You're right. Uh, so over the years, I mean, you've been doing this a long time. About How, how long have you been doing this, Steve? My fr well, 24 years. So when I got saved, I, I started preaching almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Actually, I started preaching when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was timid. I couldn't speak. I couldn't publicly speak. I stammered when I spoke. And then on the streets of Orlando, I went evangelizing and I stepped out in faith. The Holy Spirit hit me and I preached and I led people to the Lord that night. And I've been preaching ever since. That's 25 years ago. And uh, so, yeah. That's awesome. Now, when you fall in love with these people, I'm sure you keep some kind of relationship with them. What else are you doing, if anything, to help these people develop after you've helped to win them to the Lord? So when I go into a place, I don't just blow in, blow up and blow out. We stay there. We have teams, indigenous teams who stay on the ground and we travel. We disciple. Jesus commands us to make disciples of all nations, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them basically how to live the Christian walk. And that's why it's important to have a circuit like Jesus had, like, the, like my hero John Wesley had in England around Bristol. So he had a circuit and I believe in the circuit. So when I go... Uh, we visit the same churches, the same people. We may add one, take one off. If we have a team, we can have more people go into the towns. Um, I'm not a person who has to do all the speaking, do all the teaching. I believe in team ministry. And uh, we just go out and make disciples everywhere we go. We meet in homes. We meet in churches, in cafes, wherever it is that people can meet is where we'll meet. And we will have the big meetings as well. But we disciple tends to be, discipleship tends to be in the smaller groups. Well, you've already told us a number of incredible things that happen in your larger meetings. Tell us some of the benefits of meeting in the smaller meetings. Well, it started in England. We had uh, some small meetings and we had uh, this discipleship group for new believers. And as we were there, we started seeing great miracles take place. People getting delivered from demons. Demons were coming out in England out of people. Uh, we saw people getting healed, people in our living room getting saved. So much so that our house was just packed full of young people that we had to end up splitting the groups and we decided two groups and then those two groups became four groups those four groups became eight groups and then we'd meet together on a sunday to a packed standing room only church and the emphasis became the homes not the large gathering it became the individuals 
not the, the large overall group of people. And why do you think that the emphasis uh, was on the smaller group? Because discipleship, so Jesus had his 12, yeah, he had his 70, then he had his 12, his three, his one. So Jesus had a small group of people and you can't disciple everybody. When I got saved, I was in a church of uh, 10,000 people. No one knew me. I was a, a, a fish in the sea of, of other fishes, right? And uh, no one knew who I was. I couldn't be discipled. I couldn't even serve in that church. And I went to a smaller church where they discipled me and trained me. And I understood the importance of knowing those people that are teaching you and training you. So are you looking to apply any of that now um, in starting more groups like you did in England? I know you're living in the United States now. Yeah, I, I believe that every church needs to plant more churches. Every church should be expanding. Every believer should be leading people to Jesus. If you're in an area where... There's no healthy churches, Bible-believing, spirit-filled churches, and you can't plug the people in that you lead to the Lord, then you plant a church. It's that simple. Every Christian needs to be replicating who Jesus is in their life to other people. So a church plants a church, that church plants churches, and it's what we're called to do. I'm a builder by trade. I build houses, and in the Spirit, I build the kingdom of God. Well, that's just perfect, Steve. And I would like you to encourage our viewers now with what they can do in order to help expand the kingdom and make disciples like we've all been commanded to do. I'll be glad to do that. So I've got a few scriptures here. So we don't want a new Christianity. We want biblical Christianity. So where did the church meet? I just saw this the other day online. It's very important. The church met house to house, Acts 2, Acts 5, house to house, Acts 8, house after house, Acts 10, Cornelius's house, Acts 12, Mary's house, Acts 16, Jailer's house, Acts 16, Lydia's house, Acts 18, uh, Justice's house, Acts 20, house to house. is scripture after scripture where people meet in houses. Something that we can get wrong sometimes is we go for the big meetings, but we forget what it is to have community. People around the world are crying out for community. They want something in common with one another. We go for the big meetings, but we go to a large church we go in there, we need to make friends, we leave and we don't know anybody. It's important that we, we, we may have had it a little bit backwards. Nothing wrong with what's gone before, but what Jesus is saying in these days is that he wants to plant churches. We're in a church plant in move of God where people can be trained up, discipled, they can be uh, um, spotted as mature believers, and then they can be sent out into the world. Jesus said, tells us to preach the gospel to every creature and then he tells us to do miracles. Basically, do what Jesus did. Every believer the world over gets to do what Jesus did. Not just the clergy, not just the, uh, the, the leaders, not just the pastors, but every believer should be casting out devils. Every believer should be healing the sick. Every believer should be raising the dead. Every believer should be preaching the gospel. Every believer in every part of society should be doing exactly what Jesus did. That you are who Jesus said you are, he is who he says he is, and we will do what Jesus said we will do. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> Steve, thank you so much for sharing that word. I just agree wholeheartedly, and I just want to thank you again for this interview and for sharing your time with us. Would you mind hanging around to help us on our next segment where we're going to pray for people's needs? I'd love to. Thank you. Well, thank you. And so let's go to the next part of our show. that you could join us for a time of prayer. We are going to spend some time with the Lord together. And I just want to thank you, Stephen. Thank you for being here with us. I believe that God has put a word of exhortation in your mouth for those who are watching. So would you mind starting with that before we pray? I'd be happy to. In Exodus chapter 25 and 26 and Numbers chapter 8, God gives to Moses the heavenly pattern. We might call it a blueprint. So when God gave the blueprint to Moses, Moses knew how to build the tabernacle. Every one of you, God has given a blueprint for your life and for what it is that God's called you to do. Some of you may want to go out and win the world. Some of you may want to go out and win your world. We don't have to be complete world changers, but we can change the world in which we live. And so I want to pray that over you, that you will impact the lives, the lives of those around you and that you will change your world. And some of you, you may go far, 
from where you live. Some of you may go near, but God will burn that within your heart. And you know, the fire of God is what propels us. And I had a, a man of God once tell me, he said, Stephen, you cannot maintain the fire of God. The fire of God maintains you because the fire has a name and his name is Holy Spirit. And he wants to burn in you. And if you, if you allow the Holy Spirit to burn in you, whatever he's put within you will come out of you. We often pray, Lord, come down. But God is saying it's time that he came out, that the fire of God inside of us needs to come out and just spread to this world. If you've ever seen a fire burn, it, 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 it goes from one place to the next. And if we unleash it, there's no stopping it. Amen. So, Lord, in the name of Jesus, if you hear my voice, pray with me. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that the fire of God, Holy Spirit, you'd burn in me. You'd give me vision. You'd give me purpose. Lord, and I would take that purpose and that vision and I will run with it and I will give myself fully to it. I will be faithful in the things you've given me, faithful to my spouse, faithful to my children, faithful to my friends, to my school, to my work, and faithful to the call you've put upon my life. In Jesus' name, Lord, would you send me, would you send me to this world that I would change it, that I would impact it, that every person that hears my voice would come to know you, Jesus, and you alone. Lord, may I decrease or oh Lord would you increase and let me decrease that you would be glorified and magnified in my life and Jesus I believe I will go and do the things that you said I will do I will heal the sick I will raise the dead I will cast out demons I will lead people to the foot of the cross and they will come to know you fully and faithfully and if you put it within me Lord I will plant your works around the rest of the world churches in my home in cafes in schools in pubs, I don't care if it's in a pub or a bar, you go where Jesus calls you to. You take the faith that he's given you and you be faithful to that and take Jesus to this dying world because he is the hope of this world and the church is the hope of this place, of this nation, in Jesus' name. Yeah, right now I just feel the Lord stirring me for those of you who just heard that prayer and you immediately counted yourself out. You said he's praying for somebody else. I just declare over you, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. Let him lead you. I declare that a spirit of peace falls on you where you have felt anxious about doing this and a spirit of boldness fills you where you have been holding back from sharing the gospel. The Lord is in you. He is with you and he is going before you. So boldly go into your community. Boldly go into your school. Boldly go into the nations and share the hope of glory with a world that is desperate for hope. We pray this over you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, Stephen, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. We would love to invite you right now, if you have a prayer request that you would love for us to join you in prayer for, there is a number at the bottom of the screen. You can call or text. We want to partner with you, believing God for a miracle. And if you just need someone to talk to or you want to give your life to Jesus, please call the number on that screen so we can join you. And stick around because we're going to go now to a time of teaching with Pastor Tony. Ever since the day of Pentecost, Christians have been meeting together regularly. In the book of Acts, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Christians met in big groups, and they met in small groups. Each meeting had its own purpose, but the important thing is that they met. And so we have met in big groups and in small groups for 2,000 years. What is it that draws Christians together? Most enjoy being with others who share the same faith. Many go to get fed the Word of God. No doubt many enjoy singing songs together about our Lord and His greatness. For some it is force of habit, for others it is what is expected in their community. Many children go to church because their parents make them go. However, recent events have caused us all to think through why it is we go to church. Lately, we have all been weighing the positives of going to church against the negatives. 
Let's join that analysis by looking at what some scriptures say about meeting together. Back in the early church, we read where it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They came together to hear good teaching, to fellowship, to eat together, and to pray together. Those are all good reasons and necessary ones for Christians to meet. Later in Acts 10, Cornelius called for Peter to come to his home. When Peter arrived, Cornelius said to him, So I have sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Cornelius and all his house wanted to hear the word of God and the good news of his salvation. They called the trusted and mature leader to give them that word. So when we meet together, it gives our pastors and teachers an opportunity to feed us the word of God. In the recent crisis, our pastors and leaders have been using the internet and social media to teach us his word. We thank God that we can use the internet this way. I thank God for the many meetings I have been part of in this way without leaving my home. But the scriptures reveal teaching is just the beginning of what God wants to accomplish in our meetings. For example, in the book of Hebrews, it says, And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another in all the more as you see the day drawing near. This passage is often quoted almost as a mantra to compel our people to go to church meetings. But let's look at what it really says. In our meetings, we are to stir one another to love and good works, each one encouraging each other. I need your encouragement and you need mine. This is the reason we go to meeting, so that we can encourage one another to stay strong in our love for Jesus. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 14. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Here we see an emphasis on building up the church, our faith, and our maturity. This happens in a meeting where the various gifts that God has distributed among His people are used to build up everyone else. When I look at that scripture, and the one before it in particular, I see that more of the scriptural reasons for meeting together can be accomplished if more of the believers are involved in the ministry. There are more scriptures and more reasons than what I quoted here, but I encourage you today to continue to meet together, especially in meetings where a variety of people have the freedom to manifest the giftings of the Holy Spirit within them. Look for the leader of that meeting to be mature and open enough to allow such expression. You will find that these types of meetings will strengthen you and you will be anxious to return. Tony, thank you for that word that you just brought to us. I tell you what, between your word and what we just heard from Stephen, what a time we've had. You know, it's just further confirmation to me that God wants to take ordinary people and do extraordinary things with them. Well, he certainly has taken Stephen and done some amazing things, not just in large settings, but also in smaller settings, it sounded like. Yes, that's right. It seems like uh, he, he really emphasized how he loved going into villages um, and you know, meeting with whatever group. And if they have to kill the chicken right there to give him an offering, they do it. Yeah, they do that. and But the discipleship component that he did in, in those smaller settings, I think, does give a, a chance for community to develop, even to see people's gifts growing a little bit. Well, yes, that's right. As I relate back even to what I just taught, you know, the whole idea of it, that we see in Scripture is that there is room, not just for the large meeting, but also the smaller meetings where we can drill down on teaching one another what the, how to live like the Lord. I think so. And not only that, those people that uh, are a little shyer, they are in a smaller setting that gives them confidence to bring up their question, ask a little bit uh, to have something drilled down a little bit. Yes, and in our experience as pastors and leaders, I know we've both done this at home and overseas, 
where we have used small group meeting environments for allowing people to practice their teaching gifts or their prophetic gifts or praying for one another for healing or whatever. And it's been very effective in that practical part of discipleship. Yeah, those smaller settings, I tell you, they do give not just a chance for somebody to practice, but to really develop community life. I mean, I think that's where you see loving one another and caring for one another, the practical outworking of Christianity. You know, with all the things that we've experienced and we've done as pastors of churches and, um, you know, when you get through all the programs and everything, if there's not love being encouraged, what are we ending up with? Love has to be the first thing and the foremost thing all the time. Right. I think that sometimes in the larger settings that we've all been involved in, um, it's almost a lecture type situation where you're conveying mm -hmm. information. But in the small group setting, it is certainly taking some of that in, but massaging it, doing something with it, asking somebody, you bring the teaching next time. Will you pray for so-and-so to be healed and give them that opportunity? That's, that's exactly right. Um, it's so important to have that connection with people. And because if we don't have connection, we can't communicate. If we don't communicate that I don't know you. If I don't know you, I certainly can't minister to you or love you as Christ loved us. So again, we get to the point of what is the church really? We need to be more relational is what I'm getting out of this. So you're really right, Tony. This relational component is very important in a small group setting. And we thank you for tuning in today. And we just want to ask you to consider being a partner with us at Heart of Titus because at Let's Go, we have ordinary people that go to these faraway places and have a chance to really invest in others' lives to help them grow in their gifting, be it a large setting or a small setting, and so you can be a part of that. You can partner with us, whether we're trying to help somebody in their time of need or help them grow in their ministry. Look at the number on the screen right now and give us a call. Let us know that you want to join us and partner with us and help. Or you can text that information or go to our website. So thanks again for joining us on another episode of Let's Go. Thank you for joining us today. Are you enjoying the ministry, the messages, and the testimonies of Let's Go? Well, we need your help. We love being able to bring you real stories about real people doing extraordinary things for God. But that can only continue if we have folks like you partnering with us financially to keep this program on this station. Would you prayerfully consider making a donation to keep Let's Go going forth, sharing the gospel and the glorious testimonies of the power of God? God bless you and thank you for considering what you can do to help us today.